here we are again. Welcome to the Working Class Movement Library's new series of Invisible Histories Talks on the day which is designated as International Workers Memorial Day. We're very pleased to have as our speaker Katrina Goldston, who researched in the library for her new book, Irish Writers in the 30s, Art, Exile and War, is going to focus today on one of the people who feature in that book, Stella Jackson, with her talk intriguingly entitled, Stella Jackson Missing in Action. The library's events are as usual free. However, we would like to encourage you as usual to support the library if you feel able to do so. And there is a donate button on our website. Thanks for joining us, Katrina, and over to you. Okay. Um, thanks everybody. It's fantastic. And thanks to WCML for hosting this and being the place where I made uh, a great discovery to help me write uh, and add more material to uh, my book, Irish Writers and the 30s. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the genesis of the book uh, and then hone in on uh, Stella Jackson and how and why her memoir helped me to elucidate um, episodes from this sort of hidden history uh, within Irish cultural history. And I'm, I'm hoping uh, certainly people in the audience, I'm sure will know a lot more about um, Stella Jackson's father uh, and, and her wider and her family. But at the same time, uh, it would be great. People may well, I have no photograph of her for instance. So um, as you'll see, she's represented uh, by uh, the three boxes uh, of what I'm going to talk about, uh, which is the discovery of her memoir, which is um, housed with WCML. Um, and as I say, I can only conjure up word pictures of her partially from what she's written about herself and what some uh, other people have written about her in letters. So hopefully at the end, when we have a bit of discussion, uh, people may well have uh, material or um, insights or, um, you know, into uh, some of the more um, obscure aspects of her life from what I've been able to uh, glean from the sections of the memoir that I've written. So Irish Writers of the 30s, uh, the book was intended to highlight Irish writers diverse roles in left cultures of the 30s, uh, to look at their particular interpretation of popular front aesthetics, and to examine a range of uh, witness texts written by Irish poets and writers engaged with internationalism and anti-fascism, uh, and also to try and track and trace a diverse range of radical political uh, and cultural transnational networks they were part of, mostly in an Irish cultural diaspora in London in the 30s. As I've said, uh, then I'll flag up some of the themes in Stella Jackson's unpublished memoir and, uh, and uh, describe why I think it's significant in relation, not just to revealing um, an added layer to a history, hidden history of Irish writers in the thirties, but also about a day-to-day -day activist with idiosyncratic leftist views and obviously what it might mean for women's histories and uh, stories of, of the thirties and involvement with anti-fascism and Spanish civil war groups. So, I'm going to loop back because I first started off with another type of hidden history, an invisible history, uh, that of uh, Irish Jewish radicals uh, in the Jewish community in Dublin, who are more to the point trying to find any, uh, because um, it's, a, it's a very well hidden history. Um, so about the early 1990s, I was able to um, interview a man called Aubrey Dakin about his brother, Leslie Dakin, who had been given a steer that he had some left-wing politics and uh, generally as a sort of cultural uh, enabler and writer, educator, may be of interest. And during that interview, uh, Aubrey Dakin became quite emotional about his brother and his lack of recognition talked about his often futile efforts to try and write the Irish Jewish novel and his interest and uh, campaign really to gain 
uh, recognition in the sorts of things he was interested in, street rhymes, history of lullabies, street games. And this was tied into this search to try and find uh, why were there not more, ev was there more evidence of, of uh, Jewish involvement in radical causes uh, in the early 20th century? Uh, the community was uh, a small regional Jewish community, conservatively inclined. And there had been pioneering work done by trade unionist Manus O'Reardon, uh, who uncovered the history of the Jewish Tailors and Pressers Union, unearthed the fact that Labour leader uh, James Connolly had election material printed in Yiddish in 1902, obviously uh, aimed at workers. But most of this uh, remained a sort of tantalizing fragments. And uh, in the, the Jewish Museum, which is a volunteer run organization, there was very little uh, bulk of material uh, and archives to, to go through. Now, in 1998, I came across a book by the German academic H. Gustav Klaus, uh, who, was, who wrote about a, uh, an Irish uh, international brigader, Thomas O'Brien. And this book, Strong Words, Brave Deeds, uh, focused on some Irish writers, such as Dakin, as a small group of left-wing writers, uh, poets in the 30s, who had been, in his words, wiped off the literary map. Klaus was the first uh, to begin to uh, clarify my thinking around the change of Dakin's story and the approach and to articulate the concept uh, of Irish writers' role in the left cultures of the 30s uh, and to indicate they might be part of a, a louder global chorus of writers in, and where their place was in uh, writers fighting fascism and seeking new forms of egalitarian expression. The Klaus book and Discovering Janet Montefiore's Men and Women's Writers of the 30s Dangerous Tide of History changed the way I framed Dakin's life and cultural significance, uh, initially wanting to look at him as a, a relatively solitary example of, of a, a Jewish radical in mid 20th century Ireland. Andy Croft wrote of the era in 30s Britain, it was a generous moment, a critical and creative intervention that sought to be constructive to build a broad and popular imaginative and, elect and intellectual alliance against unemployment, poverty, bad housing, dangerous working conditions, educational waste to isolate the intellectual forces of the enemy. And as I got further into the research, uh, it became clear that Irish writers were also part of that small group, a small group of Irish writers, but they were part of that exciting cultural movement in Britain, in London mostly, um, whilst also looking to explore things like Irish folk tradition uh, or ballads, or attempt the avant-garde, their own different interpretations of uh, political commitment in literature. As poet Gerald Daw has argued in relation to a broader group of Irish poets in the 30s, the poets who started out in the early 30s went on to probe and explore many different avenues, their language and styles challenging what was conventional and orthodox in the poetry of the time. Historian Emmett O'Connor highlighted Leslie Dakin's anthology of proletarian poetry, which he edited, Goodbye Twilight, uh, in an essay, Identity and Self-Representation in Irish Communism, the Connolly Column and the Spanish Civil War. And uh, O'Connor viewed Dakin's book as symbolic in the cultural realm, realm of something of a popular front atmosphere in the early 30s in Ireland. And it was O'Connor, a leading labor historian, who asked me to contribute to a collection about uh, Irish uh, radical leadership called Lives on the Left, Studies in Irish Radical Leadership. At, the, at almost the same point in 2000, 2011, I was able to get access to the voluminous Dakin archive, uh, which is in the National Library in Dublin. And once I got into the archive, and had access to his files, and in particular, a very large scrapbook 
I was able to see how and where he was interconnected to very diverse groups, Irish Republicans, left Republicans in London, the British left, and a broader group of Irish writers cleaving to anti-fascism. Within the pages of the scrapbook, there were uh, little excerpts from left-wing literary magazines, uh, articles on the poet, a social rebel, promotional flyers for forgotten books, black and white woodcut illustrations of the unemployed, and uh, mimeograph pages of little newspapers with uh, their articles on proletarian rebel poetry. Uh, most of these were uh, both Dakin's cuttings and reviews and also those of his friends. So what also is reanimated through the pages of the scrapbook was a kind of spectral conversation with a group of other dead writers also intent on debating the literary and political dilemmas in the 30s relating to culture and commitment. Now, you can see there, uh, just to uh, get round to, uh, that's the uh, one of the lines of Stella Jackson's uh, obituary. We, we so, can't, uh, just to say, Katrina, we, 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 you haven't shared your screeners yet. So oh, if you sorry. want to do that, that's uh, okay. that'd be so, great. Sorry, because I can see it. So are uh, you getting it now? I think it's going to come through now. Yes. OK, if you make that full screen, then we, yeah, yeah, we will, we will be seeing OK, it. so have you got that now? OK. okay. We are. Yeah, there you go. Thank can you. Can you see that? We can. Thank you. OK, all right. So I, I've I've the photograph of the boxes, which I'll come back to again, but that's the, the last line. So basically, just to, to uh, uh, end off this section on the uh, the genesis of the book and how uh, it led me to Stella Jackson, just within the scrapbook pages again, uh, there are there are, um, mentions of uh, Montague Slater, Honor Arundel, Edgel Rickard, Irish Jewish writer Michael Sayers, uh, and at the period in mid thirties uh, in London. These are the, the people that uh, then and later uh, they could mixed with. So I came to the WCML to search, particularly for the Book of Words published by the Workers' Music Association, which was um, involving Alan Bush and Honor Arundel and a Dakin contribution. And I wanted to see if I could find any trace of Margaret Barrington, a novelist, um, also involved in Spanish Civil War initiatives and helping refugees. And she was the first women's page editor of Tribune in 1938. And uh, I did find one article by her uh, called under her maiden marriage, Margaret O'Flaherty, uh, as she was then the ex-wife of novelist Liam O'Flaherty. And a chance question to Lynette and some great detective work by Alan uh, and the three boxes of Jackson's unpublished memoir were brought up. Uh, and prior to that, I had no uh, idea whatsoever uh, of their existence. I had learned about Stella Jackson through uh, a number of the um, labyrinthine connections that brought me archival treasures and basically the I'm friendly with grandchildren of the artist Sean Keating and his wife May Keating and they were some of the social circle that Stella Jackson got inducted into and uh, one of their relatives had letters from Stella to her uh, her partner and uh, lover Edward uh, Ewart Milne and letters from Milne and that was the first introduction I had uh, to her um, to her existence at all. Now that's Leslie Dakin, who's uh, another of the writers. This is the uh, Ewart Milne, who I've just mentioned, who was Stella Jackson's partner for a number of years, good number of years, is in the hat. And, well, they're all in the hat, says you, Omberg hat. Um, it's my it's my left, so I don't know if it's your left or right. He's at the very end of the line, anyway. In that that's in Trafalgar Square, uh, and these are 
some of the uh, scrapbook entries from Dakin's work, his contributions to Anvil, edited by Jack Lindsay, and the, that's the cover of the Book of Words. So the pandemic has prevented me from reading in full uh, the, uh, the full three boxes full of uh, of Stella Jackson's uh, memoir. And just to just to say, um, for those who might know her under other names, just to add another complication to try and find her invisible history, she wrote and was called a variety of names. So. In Ireland, in the Irish social socialist circle, and I've spoken to a woman in her late 80s who knew her, she was always known as Stella Jackson, right? Now, her pen name for her one novel is Stella Fitzthomas Hagen. And if you can see there, I think it's just obscured, on the memoirs, she's calling herself Stella Hagen, and that's what she's also called uh, in her in the obituary uh, written by Edmund and Ruth Frouse, they ca they're calling her Stella Hagen. Now, just to add an extra complication, she did write under uh, for one publication. She wrote under a male pseudonym of John Hawkins, which was a, uh, for the political pamphlet, "The Irish Question Today: The Problems and Dangers of Partition" in nineteen. Uh, 41, and it was quite some digging to eventually work out the sheet in that pamphlet. So, uh, that's, as I say, I'm calling her by the Irish name, um, and she may well be known in England as Stella Hagen in, in, in other circles. But uh, Stella wasn't Irish, uh, but it was. Uh, the love of Ireland was passed on to her by her father, Tommy Jackson, T.A. Jackson, who, according to her sister before his death, one of his last delights was listening to recordings of Irish folk songs. Her grandfather was also uh, um, was a compositor with radical views, who was also unusually pro-Irish. And of course, uh, T.A. Jackson wrote Ireland her own, uh, which was... Uh, the Marxist history of Ireland. Um, so she had even in her background before she came to Ireland in the late 1930s, uh, uh, a love of Ireland and, um, and uh, a sympathy for the history and politics <clears throat> of the country. So in absence of a, of a photo, uh, I may draw a, a word picture from some of the things that she wrote about herself in her memoir and or in letters. Uh, in one letter in 1941 to Muriel McSweeney, who was the widow of Terry McSweeney, uh, the mayor of Cork, who died um, in 20, uh, after day, 77 days of hun hunger strike. So she wrote to Muriel McSweeney, who she was friendly with in Ireland, about my being masculine, I have always rather resented that label with its implication that objective reasoning and plain speaking belong to men. And if it is not in bad taste, to quote my fairly extensive past experience, men seem to find me feminine more than somewhat, unless I go out of my way to be nasty to them. In another, way, in another letter to Muriel, uh, writing about her sister Vivian, she wrote, she, she is a nice girl, very nervous and full of sensibility, but much nobler and kinder, really, than I am. Um, now, in January 1987, Stella Jackson uh, put an halt to her proposed memoir. Uh, now, she's, she's born in 1908. She'd started to write the memoir in the 80s, in her late 70s. And on the death of her partner, uh, she puts on the last page, she's not, she doesn't think she will ever manage to finish it. She'd only reached the period of the late 1940s in a life that would span from 1908 to 1993. Uh, she had ardent literary ambitions from, uh, uh, as, from a young age, but she published only one novel in her lifetime, 
the green cravat about uh, Lord Edward Fitzgerald and the 1798 rebellion uh, in Ireland against the British. She wrote a handful of plays, uh, according to the memoir, uh, uh, none of which were performed. And in her obituary in Seher, the Labour History Journal, uh, by Edmund and Ruth Frau, uh, her novel, the novel was alluded to as re receiving favourable reviews. Though throughout the obituary uh, by her friends, she still was uh, tended to be referred in relation to the more famous men in her life. Uh, that was not necessarily unusual. And uh, to a certain extent, she seems to have done this herself. So uh, the, the, the top line of the obituary is really about her father uh, and uh, an extraordinary figure in, and, and communist historian. Uh, her lover, Ewart Milne, is also mentioned uh, and her partnership with him. And in uh, the obituary of Cork writer Patrick Galvin, who was her husband uh, only for a very short time, she gets uh, a fleeting reference. So you can see uh, uh, there was something of a pattern. Sometimes a more brutal erasure uh, occurred, for instance, in Ewart Milne's a uh, timeline in the Feshrift in honour of his 80th birthday. In the chronology for the wartime years, uh, the period when uh, Milne and, and, uh, and Jackson were in Ireland, um, he summarised the period as uh, him staying with friends in Wicklow and County Cork. He'd returned to Ireland in 1939 in the company of Stella Jackson, just at the outbreak of the war. The two had first met in the rickety offices of the Spanish Medical Aid Committee uh, and in New Oxford Street at the height of those heady days of hope uh, that Republican Spain uh, might strike a hammer blow to fascism. Uh, Jackson had graduated from University College London and uh, she was working in the Spanish Medical Aid Committee and for most of her adult life she was employed teaching Russian to um, at the Soviet teaching English to uh, Russians um, in, and in the Soviet embassy uh, she was teaching English as a foreign language um, but at this period she's very much involved with the groups around support for uh, for Republican Spain and uh, this is where she meets Milne who is uh, working as a medical courier and bringing supplies out. And um, in, although there are uh, many uh, different kinds of uh, witness texts to the 30s, both written at the time and written as recollections uh, later, it strikes me that accounts like Jackson's unpublished memoir are still quite rare uh, from her um, activist daily viewpoint uh, uh, a person from uh, with a um, an, uh, a very uh, um, extremely well known uh, leftist family, uh, having a father uh, who was a, a public figure, uh, and also her passion for Ireland and what she writes about its history and politics. Now, the tone of the memoir, the sections that I've read, mostly dealing with the years in Ireland and her years uh, and the period uh, around the Spanish Civil War groups. Um, she is, it's, she's very blunt in her uh, candid depictions of uh, liaisons, bouts of depression, uh, her relationships with leftist males, which um, went very much astray, um, often because very shabby, and she's she's very blunt about having an abortion, its effects on her. Uh, it's now it's been written in the 80s about the 30s and 40s, but it's still uh, very uh, candid. Uh, and from the point of view of someone wanting to know uh, more about Irish radical groups, she she became uh, an accidental tourist and then chronicler of uh, some of the uh, literary circles in Ireland. This, she produces a lively depiction of, of, of this forgotten milieu in Irish letters. 
uh, and the affair with Milne would be an entree into a rambunctious interconnecting group of friends and political comrades. So uh, Flotsam and Jetsam is the title she gave the memoir and then that subtitle memoirs of a revolutionary author uh, and obviously the revolutionary in question was uh, T.A. Jackson, Tommy Jackson. Um, <clears throat> as I've said, he passed on to her his love of Ireland as she put it, I was suckled, weaned and reared on the dialectic and on Irish history. And she commented in the memoir that she knew more about Irish history than her lover, Wicklow man, Ewart Milne. She defined herself in a, a, a fairly typical self-deprecating manner as a crazy mixed up classless intellectual. Uh, obviously she was brought up uh, in a household where politics were grist to the mill. Uh, there was the reality of midnight flits or lack of food. And Vivian Morton, her sister, recalled one incident when the girls went off to school one morning and returned to discover they had neither home nor possessions, as the bailiffs had removed every book, every childish treasure. Her mother, Katie Hawkins, died when the sisters were in their late teens. And Jackson recounts, she declared her ambition to uh, be a writer as early as 10, uh, but her mother uh, poo-pooed the idea. Jackson represents herself as a backroom figure in 30s political circles, and to a certain extent that's true, though Barbara Castle, for one, uh, encouraged her to stand for Parliament. Jackson and Castle briefly shared accommodation in the 30s when uh, Barbara Castle was still Barbara Betts. Uh, and Jackson has uh, various amusing uh, and uh, trenchant observations on the young Barbara uh, in the memoir. As I've said, she began committing it to paper in the 80s. Uh, the novel, The Green Cravat, had been published in 1959 by Hodder and Stoughton, and it was republished in 1970. Uh, Rosamond Jacob, an Irish novelist who, was, who also was in the broader circle of uh, writers I focus on uh, in the Irish Democrat, called it the best piece of Irish history in the guise of a novel that I know of. Now, amongst the pages in the manuscript, there is a letter from Lord Callanan of Four Provinces Films, which indicates a brief flurry of interest in adapting her book for the big screen, though Callanan wryly mused that Hollywood's interest in historical films rarely went beyond Madame Pompadour. Now, just before uh, going through some of Jackson's uh, observations and uh, uh, her view of the Irish cultural scene uh, in wartime Ireland, just want to give a little context to the background of being left wing in 30s Ireland, uh, which could mean anything from being physically attacked, uh, a dismissal from a job, social opprobrium, uh, even the business of holding a meeting could be complicated. Activist Nora Harkin recalled that during the Civil War, a Spanish Civil War period, it was very difficult to book a room when it, be, it was revealed that the committee was supporting Republican Spain. Activist and novelist, novelist Padre O'Donnell has described in his book, Salute, uh, on, uh, on, on Spain and Spanish Civil War. Meetings in Ireland of uh, several thousand where you, they, you were heckled. And he also writes about one particular form of weapon, potatoes studded with razor blades. Uh, during the 30s, there were attempts to burn down the Communist Party of headquarters. Uh, Michael McInerney, activist, with only a slight exaggeration, the, uh, noted that the Red Scare lasted in Ireland from the 1930s to the 1960s. Um, and uh, obviously the small numbers of actual communists uh, in the 30s, uh, perhaps a, a, a group of 100 max with 20 to 30 activists may make it seem curious that the most virulent Red Scare years in the 30s uh, 
of course, tied into church influence, um, brought in a strong anti-communist ambience. However, in the early 30s, it was not just the church, but the Department of Justice in the newly formed Irish Free State, who feared what officials called a communistic turn for the IRA. So all of these uh, uh, features were part of the reason why uh, the Irish writer, writers featured in the book, obviously, as well as the economic impetus, left Ireland in the 1930s. Uh, historian uh, Mary E. Daly, writing about the exodus from Ireland in the 30s, uh, emigration, of emigration exodus, wrote, although the overwhelming majority left for economic reasons, emigration also provided an escape for misfits, veteran Republicans who could not adjust to the new state, disillusioned writers and intellectuals, or those stifled by an introspective Ireland. And Dakin and Ewart Milne and the others who uh, uh, Stella Jackson came in contact with, for the writers who went to London, that could be said to fit. Um, so when they, uh, when they come back to Ireland, it's literally just at the outbreak of war, within a few weeks of the outbreak of war, uh, when Ireland is uh, gearing up with the complications of wartime neutrality, um, the structures to be put in place for censorship, surveillance. So this is the atmosphere uh, into which uh, Milne and Stella Jackson, uh, 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 an Irish uh, uh, officiant, a keen supporter of Irish independence, and then complicated by the different attitudes to neutrality uh, from the part of her, her partner. Her observations about her sojourn in wartime Ireland are replete with telling detail. The fact that she appears to have remembered of conversation for verbatim does beg the question of whether she also kept diaries, which are now lost. Given that she began uh, writing her memoir uh, when she was in her late 70s, it seems unlikely she could have remembered events in such detail without notes, or perhaps uh, she decided to blur the lines between memoir and invention, uh, we can't really know. Her sharp uh, observations on attitudes to war in Ireland included difference between geography and location, rural versus urban, uh, and what that difference could make to opinions about Ireland's neutrality. Jackson found the intellectual ambiance stimulating in the circles they moved in, though she was at first shocked by overt signs of poverty in Ireland. She also became more, and I quote, oppressively aware of the very, very heavy Catholic atmosphere everywhere. At the parties and gatherings where Jackson mingled with significant Irish cultural figures, such as uh, the painter Sean Keating, his politically radical wife May, the ed literary editor of the left liberal uh, magazine Ireland Today, she listened to gossip and debate on new poets. But sometimes the pleasing uh, atmosphere, both uh, in their uh, domestic uh, affairs and the lively social life it could uh, find darker episodes intruding. She recalled an unpleasant incident uh, when she'd gone for a walk in unknown terrain only to find herself in a small townland where a gaggle of children ran after her calling her proddy whore and a group of adults including a local priest looked on and some of the men joined in the vicious jagged chorus. It stayed in her mind as a kind of medieval witchcraft scene. Nonetheless, in the how she shared with Milne and the writer Margaret Barrington, uh, writing was part of the atmosphere. In one room, Barrington would be writing, and then in another, Milne. And at that point, uh, Stella Jackson herself began to explore the history um, in Ireland and to look at uh, something that might be an idea for her own book. The three uh, moved to Lepp in County Cork, uh, where Barrington was a sort of scatty landlady, and uh, they all were focused on, the, on their task around writing, 
proofreading. And at this point, um, Jackson begins the research into the 1798 rebellion, which will later feature uh, as the theme for her, her book in published in 1959. She also was waiting for the publication of her pamphlet on partition, uh, sponsored by the Fabe Society. Uh, she agreed to write under the pseudonym John Hawkins because her own name and left circles would be well known. And as she put it, she'd inevitably be associated as the elder daughter of the notorious communist and vehement Marxist propagandist Jackson. Uh, she conducted research throughout. Uh, she had conducted research throughout Ireland and from some Irish in Britain groups. Uh, now, to publish this in wartime, obviously with the sensitivities, uh, was uh, perhaps uh, a risk. Uh, but she didn't. She didn't receive any unwarranted official attention after the publication of the pamphlet. And she wrote to John Parker, the Labour MP, describing some scare stories and invasion talk circulating at that point in 1941 in the Cork area. Two days after posting the letter, the, the household was awoken by a loud knocking and the appearance of two officers of the Garda Shikona who demanded entry uh, to serve Jackson with a deportation order issued by the Minister for Justice, Jerry Boland, uh, and the on the kind of infringement of neutrality. Jackson believed perhaps it was a pamphlet rather than the information she shared in the letter that there was a reason for her arrest and deportation. And despite attempts by May Keating and members of the Irish Labour Party to intercede, uh, she was uh, brought to Mountjoy Prison and swiftly deported. Now, there's a file in military archives, which I have not gotten sight of, which refers to an English woman in the Cork region making suspicious trips to the coast and being deported on those grounds. Uh, now, she has very little reference to travel to the coast. Her time in Ireland in the 30s and 40s, she looked back on as a genuine idol, and it had an unexpected outcome, which enhanced her own rather fragile sense of self-worth. In Ireland, few people knew her father. Thus, she was not regarded, as she put it, as an extrapolation of Tommy's. At long, long last, I began having a clear sense of identity, a proper perception of myself as uh, a separate person, and I gained greatly in confidence. Now, Zella Jackson's memoir, uh, such as the sections is, I don't think is necessarily an archival find that reveals the erasure of a, a, a huge literary talent. I mean, it, it's, it clearly, uh, she intended it for publication. You're not going to uh, produce the, 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 the size of what is in those boxes, the, the sheer, uh, heft of humanity. Uh, she clearly wanted to put um, put her her own uh, story on the record. Uh, but it's so it's it's heft and significance in its key cultural and social details, an unusual account of some of the more day-to-day -day types of activism as told by a woman on the left with a sometimes complex relationship to left-wing groups. Um, now, in her obituary, there's no reference to uh, what she refers to a stint on the Council for uh, St Pancras, uh, but uh, she moved in quite diverse leftist circles, um, ju not just those supporting Republican Spain. She wrote with wry humour about the maladroit assumptions often made about her political affiliations with regards to her father in an opinion piece for The Spectator in the 1970s called The Wearing of the Red, uh, a play on the old uh, Irish ballad, uh, the rebel song, The Wearing of the Green. So I don't know if she ever tried to get it published. Uh, there are various reasons, uh, uh, possibly at one level, it might seem to fit into a feminist imprint because of her 
uh, her uh, honesty about uh, sexual politics or honesty about her abortion. And yet at the same time, she has quite um, uh, extraordinary expressions of adoration for Milne, uh, even though uh, his treatment is, is also sometimes shabby. Uh, so she was writing in the Thatcherite 80s, not an auspicious decade necessarily to pen. So we don't really know now did she try to get it published? There are some notes in the front that seem to indicate that somebody had an editorial eye on it. But I can see also, uh, and bluntly, there may well uh, still have been issues of libel for some of the men that she was talking about. Um, and uh, some of these, I have managed to locate one person uh, who she named uh, and another couple uh, who seem to be uh, she's given them pseudonyms so uh, i mean there's a mass of complications there with just that to be honest but you know fr from my point of view is she uh, she has provided a window onto the world that i was trying to illuminate she's provided another aspect and she's provided a female voice and uh, she's got an intimate snapshot of the um irish uh, cultural scene and and in the interwar period and uh, London of the interwar years as well, uh, which expanded my knowledge of uh, what I was trying to document as a rich cultural episode in Irish literary history. Um, so thanks to her and the other writers in the Dakin Circle, we can begin to construct a more, a clearer record of what Irish writers and artists were doing and thinking in the 30s and 40s and how their actions chimed with a broader internationalist anti-fascist movement. And I think, as I say, for her, for her rich social detail and what she's added, uh, already to accounts of the era, uh, that is is certainly something um, of a discovery. Uh, so thank you. I I landed there. Uh, if people would like now, just sorry, I just wanted to show that's the green cravat cover. Um, Apolo the, uh, apologies. I I. Uh... That's all right. Don't <laughs> worry. That's fine. So I can escape from that now. You, you, if you go, yeah. yes, go back yeah. into it. Sorry, Katrina. Yeah, uh, there's some moments when when the, the the network bandwidth has been low, so so we've we've uh, had a few sound issues, but I think okay. I think we're okay. But uh, everyone's every, everyone's still here, so that's great. Okay. All right. Do so, you want to try sharing your screen again? Uh, no. Where have we gone? I just to show the cover of where has she gone? It's gone. Oh yeah of the, uh, that's the green cravat. No, uh, from beginning. Oh, no, we're going back. So, sorry. This is what we missed, so that's great. Yes, <laughs> uh, that's May Keating, Margaret Barrington, uh, who was also, and there's her cover slightly foxed, sorry. No, get that out. No, sorry, come back. No. Okay, is that yeah? Right, so, brilliant, Katrina. Yes, thank you. Yes. And you're going to wave a wave a copy of your your no, book. Oh, God, oh, that's it. Forgot. <laughs> no, there we are. So that's Routledge, and they did a kind of a funky turquoise <laughs> on the front. So there we go. <laughs> Thank you, thank you yes. so much, and I, I, I apologise for not prompting you sooner about the uh, uh, about your, your slides. Yeah. I thought you were maybe starting with it before you started screen sharing. So sorry about that. But I'm glad I'm glad we've seen them all now. Um, yes, that is uh, that, that's just fascinating. It's, it's it's fantastic for for us as an example of the sorts of treasures which are still hidden in the library. Yes. Yes. Even after yes. all this time, and uh, my colleague Jane has spent many years now cataloguing um, treasures, but we still find things um, which are, are still sort of proper invisible histories. So it's uh, it's brilliant that uh, you've been able to highlight so much about it and, and help it be less invisible. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Well, and so, sorry, yes, go well, on. Just to say that without organisations like yourself at House, you know, we're we're all in in a in a bind, you know, because apart, you know, obviously national archives do great work, but you know, the Marks Memorial Library, people like yourselves, I wouldn't have been able, you know, I came late to this material when I had an awful lot of work done on on the book. Uh, and between that and the sort of kindness of families who dug up letters, and then, you know, even the existence of herself, I only learned now through a friend, grandmother, talking and whatever. So, I mean, the families who shared material uh, and then having uh, special dedicated archives. I mean, this is this is why <laughs> the histories are invisible partially. Uh, and I was very conscious about women's histories because I... The women I wanted to write about, uh, other like Mae Keating, who's the grandmother of a very good friend of mine, her, her sister threw out all her correspondence and archives because she didn't agree with her politics and got into the house and threw the stuff away. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, because she didn't agree with her left wing politics, she was, I think the sister was religious. Anyway, the point is that was a mass of material that was thrown out. And I had other examples. Uh, and then there were some other women who uh, feminist historian here have done terrific work. They had full biographies, but even Margaret Barrington, the same in terms of getting further. So if we don't have the archives, we can't get the, the histories can't be made visible. I'm, I'm a, an evangelist for this, because when you're trying to, to get these hidden histories, uh, you're, you're really uh, you're really having to depend on hopefully having a dedicated uh, specialist archive uh, and also the generosity of people who believe their relatives deserve to have the material kept, you know? And, and this is the example of Dakin, his brother, he didn't share the politics, but he, he is responsible along with uh, Dakin's daughter for delivering all that massive archive into the National Library of Ireland. If I, I mean, that's the whole, so much, I'd never have found all the other writers, all the other groups, the people that believe in the importance of the archives and keep them and give them are also the unsung heroes in the story because yeah. they, they are validating the person's life and their work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then that's absolutely our founders, um, Eddie and Ruth, uh, not only writing that, that obituary, but also keeping the, those uh, boxes of material. Yeah. Just yes. for you to come and find yes. all those years yes. later. Yes. It, it's yes. fantastic. They would have been so pleased uh, to, that this talk is happening and, 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 and what you've discovered. We've, we've got a few, we've certainly got a few questions, which I'll get. And, and uh, Ken Whitaker is first one. Uh, and he says, Why do you think she used a male name for one of her political writings? Can you say it was John? What was the Hawkins. surname? Hawkins. Sorry? Hawkins. Hawkins. Okay. Uh, now, I think that was the mother's family name. Um, I think what, what the main uh, referring there, I, I, I haven't got the actual detail if the Fabian Society were worried about putting her name on it, uh, but it was because of the association that she would have been so well known connected to her father and that would immediately put a, a different reception on it. That seems to have been the, um, the attitude and uh, from what I can gather, that was also fear of, of the Fabian Society, that immediately she would be pigeonholed and therefore the work would be regarded uh, possibly in a different light, whereas John Hawkins, uh, that's, uh, that's harking back to her own mother's uh, name. But it's also a male name. She could have said Joan Hawkins, for instance. She could have. Uh, she could have. You're, you're absolutely right. So for whatever reason... And it's interesting because that's a hardcore political pamphlet that she's doing. Um, apart from the worry about being associated with the father, I don't know why uh, she took on that pers persona, uh, shall we say, but it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's this business of names. And again, when you're trying to dig out invisible histories, I find with the leftists, like, uh, Leslie Dakin also wrote under the, the pseudonym Ned E. Kiernan for Irish Republican magazines when he wrote in those magazines and he wrote some of his radical 
uh, poetry on the themes of unemployment and Irish workers who died in England. He wrote those poems under the name of Neddy Kiernan. He didn't write it under Leslie Dakin, which were, were his Jewish uh, persona, I suppose, would have been. Um, so that's another issue for uh, invisible and visible histories, how we literally have to negotiate they're, they're taking different names yeah. and writing under different names. I know people can do that in other arenas, but I, I find, you know, trying to track people and then sometimes they're they're under, uh, you know, anonymous or something. You know? So it's, it's quite difficult. But thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know why the mail, but I do know there was a worry about how she would be interpreted. So that's... Yeah. So, so somebody said that, that Stella was a member of the Socialist Party of Great Britain under the name Stella Stewart. Aha, uh -huh. well, there uh, you go. And she published an article in the Socialist uh -huh. Standard on William Morris. And so, and meanwhile, I have checked on our catalogue and we have the John Hawkins pamphlet, uh -huh. which just says John Hawkins. So um, yes. my colleague Jane can yes. re catalogue to, to add in the fact that, um, uh, yes. in fact, it's Stella. Yes. So yeah. that's that's wonderful. She wrote, yeah. she also, I mean, she wrote for the Daily Worker and the Irish Democrat. And then in, in the, the later years, uh, some a number of articles, not many that I've been able to find for the um, for the spectator. But now we have a whole other. She could be Stella Stewart. Now, that's interesting because um, her partner, Ewart Milne, ah. E-W-A-R-T, yeah, and then she's there, Stella Stewart. Um, so that may be another explanation. Interesting. <laughs> do you do crosswords, Katrina? That's, that's, that's <laughs> I will after this. <laughs> uh, Liam, you wanted to ask a question. If you want to unmute yourself, um, go ahead. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi there. Actually, my name's not Liam. That's my son's name for some oh, reason. Okay. Sorry, his account. Um, to follow up on the comment about Stella Stewart, um, she was actually a member of the Socialist Party of Great Britain from 1932 to 1936. And she didn't just write one article in the, social, the journal of the Socialist Standard, she wrote seven or eight. Uh, yeah. And I, I will scan, so I'll, there's, there's six of her articles that have yet to be scanned in to put on the internet, but I will do that because I do archival work for the Socialist Standard. Okay. Uh, just some back, background on Stella Stewart. Um, yes. Her, um, her mother, Katie Hawkins, was the cousin of Anthony Hope Hawkins, who was the author of The Prisoner of Zenda. Oh, wow. And um, wow. Tom, Tommy Jackson, Katie Hawkins, and I believe Katie Hawkins' brother, Horace Hawkins, were all founder members of the Socialist Party Group Britain. Um, Tommy Jackson, obviously by the 30s, was a leading member of the British That's Communist good, yes. Party. Yes, but it's fascinating that Stella was a member of the SPGB for like, and an act, a very active speaker and writer for the SPGB for like nearly four and a half years in the thirties. Whilst her father was this very prominent member of the CPGB. So I was curious if yes. there's any mention of her membership in her memoirs because she left under acrimonious circumstances. She actually resigned, I believe, in uh, I think it was early '36. Uh, so I'm curious about that. And I mean, with, with regards to Tommy Jackson, um, I've read Solo Trumpet, which is his autobiography, and it's a fascinating read. But when he published it, he ref he refused to refer to his membership of the SPGB, even though he was a very active member for like nearly six years. And so he would mention all these individuals that he do in the SPGB. Yes. And even you mentioned Ireland Her Own, which he dedicated to Con Lahan. He was also yes. found a member yes. of the SPGB. So I, I'm just curious if her memoir, because I live in New York, so I'm never going to get access to this uh, oh. autobiography. So I'm just curious if she mentions the SPGB and the, the manuscript, because obviously as somebody who's interested in the history of the SPGB, I would be fascinated to know what she's writing about, who she's writing about, because... Well, I am, I am, I'm sure I didn't see those very early sections, but I'm sure that she must have because I was going in at the with a limited uh, um, period of time and getting getting stuff before we we were all locked away and uh, starting from her Spanish medical aid. I went in from that, but she's got a big tranche of the first box and I'm sure 
there absolutely has to be reference to that in, in the earlier sections. Um, uh, there has to be, I, I, I would assume. Um, but I'm sure we can volunteer to get somebody to find it for you. Do, do you want to drop us a line at the library and we'll see what we can do? Yeah, thank you. And, and yeah. at my end, I mean, regards to not having a picture of her, I will ask some colleagues because the SPGB, there's like, they always used to take a photograph of their conferences in the early 30s. So there's a chance I can find maybe the pictures from like 32 to 36. And well, the, reality, the reality is, is yes. there wasn't a lot of women in the SPGP in the oh. 1930s. Yes. So there's, you know, you you know, she's in her early 20s. You know, there's a good, she might look like her dad, you know, so there's a good chance we might be able to find a picture of her. So I'll, I'll, I'll contact some colleagues and ask. But that's can, brilliant. That's yeah. brilliant. And I'll, I'll scan in. She wrote a five part art series on men and literature. It was basically just a history of literature from Chaucer up until the modern day, which was published in the social standard. And I can scan that in at some point and I'll just, I'll send on a link, you know, and I'll send on a link to someone oh, and they can pass brilliant. on to you. They can yes. pass on to oh, you. Oh, listen, that's fantastic. But you see, look at this. I mean, a, a woman of many names and many affiliations already. So that that would just be fantastic and brilliant for, for the library as well to have that uh, material. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for tuning yeah. in from New York, especially. That's, yes. that's brilliant. I'm, I'm intrigued as to how you, how you knew about the talk in New York. But, but our, our fame is obviously spreading further than the talk, Katrina, isn't it? Is. Um, okay. Has anybody else got a question? It's kind of hard to top that one, I have to, I have yes. to say. But has, has, yes. has, has yes. anybody else got a question or a, a comment? No, you see, we can't top no. it. No, it's no, no. I have to say that that's pretty spectacular. Yeah. <laughs> that's, sorry, and it's not Liam. What? What's your first name? Is he gone again? I think he's muted what? himself. Uh, my name's Darren. Darren. Ah, oh, yeah. Darren, yeah. yeah. Your son's. Your son's Liam. Yeah, my son's Liam. My name's yeah. Darren. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, that's that's just brilliant, and I have to say. I, I genuinely, you know, was hoping uh, that that's certainly more than I could hope, hope for and to get a photograph of her because, you know, yourself, you know, you want to, to know about the folk you're you're writing about. You want to. Uh, and, and the fact that she's one of the few women uh, at that early stage, all you know, that opens up a whole other other aspect. Uh, I mean, I'm in, I mean, I'm interested in the idea uh, of ta of taking this, you know, where, where she's she's telling a, a woman's story, and as I say, the, the sort of uh, uh, very blunt uh, uh, sections of 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 uh, some of her liaisons and her and her treatment within, uh, and, and they're mostly left wing men that she's having uh, the relationships with. Um, but I, I'm just I'm kind of fascinated if. Had she taken that manuscript to publishers in the eighties, to a to a sort of a, a left press, would there have been worries? Does anybody have a have an, have an idea? Would there have been worries about mentioning some of the people? Now, as I said, some of them are under disguised names. But um, I'm just curious: Did she ever get to that point of bringing it to a left wing press, and nobody been interested? Now, it's as you can see, it's huge. It definitely would have required editing. It would have required, but when you see, you know, other diaries and journals of the time in terms of a, of a revisiting of the thirties, I just kind of wonder, was it never brought to anybody or, or what? We'll never know now, but I don't know if anybody knows about in the, in the eighties, we're assuming it wouldn't have been a hospitable climate necessarily to, to publish such a memoir, not just from the sexual polit well, the sexual politics, she might have she might have got an audience, but for the just the general uh, cultural atmosphere, then would it would it just have been, you know, Lynette? I don't know what you think, or does anybody? I, I, it's certainly not one that, that, that I would know about. If, if anybody watching this later on YouTube uh, yes. wants to get in touch with the library with, with, with any kind of thoughts about that, 
then do please drop us a line, uh, email at info at wcml.org.uk or just go via the website. Um, yeah, all contributions welcome. Eleanor is waving at me. I don't know if she has it. Yes, do unmute yourself, Eleanor. Hello, Eleanor. Um, hello, Eleanor. The question I wanted to ask is, uh, when I grew up, the most important Irish writer in my family who were communist was uh, Sean O'Casey. Yes. Would, would, would they, would the Jackson, well, would Seller have known him or had any contact with, with him? Well, uh, there's no, there's not mentioned in the paper uh, because Sean O'Casey has, he was, uh, the younger writers who would have been young at that point, like Leslie Dakin, there is correspondence between himself and Sean O'Casey. And there is a, a heartbreaking, uh, very poignant uh, correspondence between Muriel McSweeney and Sean O'Casey. Um, so, the, I mean, Dakin looked up to O'Casey and was in touch with them. In the sections that I read, uh, I don't think there was a reference, like obviously he was living, she's living in Ireland between 1939 to 41 in the wartime. Uh, and then the earlier period when she's in London uh, with this, doing this work for the Spanish Medical Aid Committee. I, don't, I didn't note uh, references to, um, to coming into social contact because the group in Ireland from 39 to 41, obviously Sean O'Casey's still living in uh, in England, but Jack and Minna Carney, who were good friends, they, they're, they're interconnecting circles. So in terms of how much um, okay. personal contact she had, there's not a lot, but uh, you know, there's no doubt that all those groups sort of shifted in their, in their relations to one another or whether they met, how they, where, where they met, uh, in terms of the archival stuff, I've no letters. I've no, apart from the Dakin and O'Casey letters uh, that show, but then I've only a very small cache of her letters, uh, which is to Muriel McSweeney. Um, and of course, Muriel McSweeney uh, was communist and uh, was uh, involved in a very controversial issue about her daughter. And she claimed her daughter was kidnapped from her uh, uh, and brought back to Ireland because she was regarded as an immoral uh, um, influence because of her politics and because of, and this is some of the content of the letter that she writes to Sean O'Casey much later, uh, talking about her side of the story. Now she's completely vilified in other sectors uh, about this, this episode with her, with her daughter. But she writes very movingly to Sean O'Casey about her point of view and, and uh, the effect on her life. Uh, so Muriel McSweeney took a kind of a motherly role looking after Ewart Mill when um, Stella Jackson was deported. So they're, they're, they let, they're the letters I have which are really Stella writing to her saying, he's got a very sensitive stomach, don't give him this to eat, don't give him that to eat. Uh, you know, very concerned about him when she's, you know, been deported. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, a cache of about 10 to 12 letters. But obviously they, I mean, they could hugely admired um, O'Casey and, and had, uh, uh, you know, had a, a bit of correspondence with him and, and looked up to him. Just uh, okay. yeah, yeah, sorry, carry, carry on, Anna. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, bit, uh, perhaps a bit out of order, but I do think that one of the fantastic lines from Shauna Casey, "'Tis my rule never to lose me temper unless it would be detrimental to me interests to keep it." And I think that's, I think you, that's such a good advice to any political person. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, well, Eleanor. That, yeah. yes, that, 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 that could be a good note to end on, I think, unless, <laughs> unless any, as, as, as anybody, anybody can improve on that. More quotes from O'Casey or anybody else. <laughs> so, thank you, Darren, for that link. I will send the chat through to you, Katrina, so that you can yes. see the, the link that Darren sent and, and other things that uh, people have said. And, and uh, 
and shown their appreciation of you. And, and uh, a particular thank you for using the word rambunctious, which I don't think has appeared <laughs> in any of our 37 <laughs> talks to date. So that's fantastic. <laughs> well, so, listen, thank, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. And it just, yeah, it's fantastic. And yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And so next week on Wednesday, the 5th of May, we've got a book launch for you. Ben Harker's The Chronology of Revolution, Communism, Culture and Civil Society in 20th Century Britain. And we hope that you can join us. This talk has okay. been recorded too, and um, it'll be uploaded to our YouTube channel shortly at youtube.com forward slash WCM library. And again, a reminder that our talks are free. However, we would like to encourage you to support the library if you're able to do so. And there's a donate button on our website. Thanks again and goodbye until the same time next week. Take care in solidarity with thanks from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>